if he is our father, this should be our same level of dedication. That doesn't mean we're going to do exactly the same things Jesus did. It means we're going to be dedicated to being pleasing to our Father in heaven. We're going to be dedicated to listening to and walking in the Spirit. We're going to be dedicated to learning from the Word of the Lord how now we shall live if He is our Father. Okay, join me now as we take a close look at the word of the Lord found in Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward... How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and you set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. This particular chapter is one of the places of strength in God's word that deals with the humanity of Jesus. And we're going to touch on this today, and we're going to talk about it at great length. The reason we're going to talk about it at great length is because over the years as I've talked to people, I find that people often discount either without saying or actually outwardly say when they're having a discussion and it's brought to their attention that Jesus is to be our example. The fallback position for most people who are not doing well is to say, but Jesus is God. And so therefore, I am not expected to be like Jesus. Furthermore, that's almost a default position. I can't be like Jesus because he's God. And this is an important subject. And unfortunately, that position is reinforced by so many people that say things that are not true. That say things that are contrary 
to the will of the Lord. He begins chapter 2 telling us that we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away. The language construction is very important so that we don't just change it into whatever we want it to mean. The writer of this letter uses the pronoun we. That means, therefore, you and I must give the more earnest heed to the things you and I have heard, lest you and I drift away. The writer of Hebrews clearly here is not an uninspired a person who is not filled with the Holy Spirit, who is not a child of God. The writer of Hebrews is clearly a child of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, and writing a message of the Holy Spirit to those who are his, and including himself in the message. This takes away all possibility of negating the message, saying, oh, well, this just means people who aren't yet saved. That's an absolutely abject false claim. And it is a claim that would be made by those either who are ignorant or who are willingly serving the devil. But it is not a claim made by those who understand what the word of God says. He says, the reason for this is, for if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we... You and I escape if we, you and I, neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us, you and I, by those who heard him. This is a statement that is to each one of us that are children of God. This entire letter is not an evangelical letter. It is not intended to be announcing the gospel for the first time to anyone. It is intended to speak to people who have already heard and received the gospel, who are growing weary of following Jesus because of the consequences they're experiencing in this life, the challenges that they're facing. And they're contemplating returning back to their old systems of rituals and uh, abiding in the Mosaic law, thus throwing off Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, and claiming that he was no one special. That ultimately, did he die on the cross? Yes, but he died a criminal's death. And did he rise again from the dead? No, they will propagate, if they return, the lies that are going around at that time in the uh, minds and through the mouths of the Jews who are saying that Jesus' body was just stolen. And they would do this so that they could get things back that are in the world presently for temporary relief of the things they have lost. And he's warning those people who have already heard the gospel, already surrendered to Christ, already committed their lives to him, have been following him such that they have experienced a certain amount of consequence in their life and they're growing weary. And he says, hey, you and me, you and I, we need to give more earnest heed to the things we've heard lest you and I drift away. And the reason is because even in the old system, before Jesus came, the words spoken through angels proved steadfast, true, Immutable, unchangeable, inviolable. And every transgression and disobedience received a just reward or punishment. He says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We've been given more. And he says, if they actually had to incur the penalties that God had promised. You see, God's promises has two sides to the coin, right? The promises of blessings to those who follow him, and not just things temporarily that we want. He says, in this world, you will have tribulation. He's talking about the blessings of the eternal presence of God in our lives and the eternal promises of God. And maybe we'll get things in this life to go along with it. And he will attend to the things that we need, he promises. 
But see, the, God also has other promises. And those promises include the promises of curses for those who are disobedient. The promises of punishment to those who do not listen to him and follow him. Unwilling to follow him. That's why he says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him and confirmed by God's power in signs and wonders. By the way, the power of God through the Holy Spirit, according to his own will, as we see in verse four. Now, all of this is built on what we've already established in chapter one, which is the supremacy of Jesus Christ being greater than anyone else, including the angels. That's what chapter one is all about. And that his message would be the most solid message we could possibly listen to and learn from. And he goes on to say that Jesus, the next segment of this, he goes on to say, Jesus, you know what he did? As the infinite God with all power, all knowledge, all wisdom, all understanding, and being ever present everywhere at all times, he set those divine characteristics aside and confined himself in human flesh and became wholly human for a little while. Just like you and I are, so that he could show us how to live the way we can live a life dedicated to our Father in heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord, after having been risen from the dead and ascended on high. He was not simultaneously fully privileged with all the divine knowledge and power and all the things that come with being the infinite God while he was in the flesh from birth from Mary's womb until death on the cross. This is the next part. He says, for he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. He sub subjected it to man. That's what the next part here says. But one testified in a certain place, what is man that you are mindful of him? That alone is an amazing thing, by the way, that God tends to us in such meticulous ways. Or the son of man that you take care of him. You have made him a little lower than the angels. Lower in capacity, lower in rank, lower in ability. And in the Greek here, it also means for a little while. That fits perfectly with our understanding, if we do rightly understand what God says, that Jesus became flesh because he was something else before. And he became flesh and dwelt among us so that he could be just like us. And he has to be because if you read the rest of chapter two, as we go on, you have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Well, Adam gave that away, didn't he? He gave it away to the devil when he took the fruit and ate it at the deception of the devil against Eve and the temptation for Adam to choose Eve over God. Rest of verse 8, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him, but now we do not see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels. That's the same description as how God made man. For the suffering of death, just so we're not unclear, if Jesus doesn't become wholly human, how does he possibly die? It's not reasonable because God cannot die unless Jesus is wholly human. Now, some people will say, wait a minute, then how has God remained God? Well, that's actually an easy answer, but you have to remember that God is three persons in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if the Son, for a little while, becomes lower than the angels, it doesn't negate anything about the Father and the Holy Spirit. I have a 50-point explanation of the humanity of Jesus and his dependence upon the Holy Spirit and his father while he lives in the flesh 
before he goes to the cross. And it's amazing the things that are explained by the word of God about the characteristics of Jesus while he's in the flesh. Tell me if these things sound to you like he's fully God while he's in the flesh. According to God, Jesus walked in the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 11, chapter, two, or chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, and Hebrews 5, 7. We'll get there. Jesus had to grow in spirit, wisdom, grace, and stature with God. Luke 2, 40 and 2, 52. How are these things possible if Jesus was fully God? How can God grow in wisdom? How can God grow in grace? How can God grow in spirit? According to God in Galatians chapter 4, Jesus was born under the law. God can never be confined under the law. God's the maker of the law and the enforcer of the law. According to the Holy Spirit in Zechariah 14 and Jesus in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, Jesus does not, did not possess certain knowledge between birth and death. According to the word of the Lord in Matthew 4 and Luke 4 and Hebrews 4, Jesus was tempted by evil. But according to James chapter 1, God cannot be tempted by evil nor tempts anyone. So why is this important? This is really important to recognize so that we don't ever give the excuse that I can't be like Jesus, so I can't follow him. So that I would ever consider that I can't do what he's done. Jesus tells us in John chapter 13 that he did give us an example that he does want us to follow and do as he did. Jesus also tells us in that same chapter in Gospel of John chapter 13 that we are to love one another as Jesus has loved us. He tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that we're supposed to live as Jesus lived. And he tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 and chapter 4 that we're supposed to be willing to endure suffering as Jesus also did. And he tells us in the first, in the first epistle of John chapter 4 that the devil will attempt to teach otherwise. Well, otherwise what? Otherwise meaning that Jesus did not come in, in the flesh and become fully human so that we will doubt this passage in 1 John is worth reading because it's a very, very strong passage. 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is already in the world. This is what God says to us. Anybody who contradicts that Jesus made himself a little lower than the angels for a little while doesn't know the truth about God's word, either ignorantly or willfully. In Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, the Lord says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. This he made himself of no reputation, literally translated is, he emptied himself and set aside his divine characteristics to become fully human. Well, if you read on in chapter 2 here in he Hebrews, it fully confirms this. But we see Jesus, verse 9, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, 
crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Having conquered our enemies of death, Satan and sin, he has risen from the dead and he has been crowned with glory and honor. In John chapter 17, Jesus, when he's praying to his father, says, Father, restore to me the glory I once had with you before the foundations of the earth. Jesus is acknowledging it had to be set aside for a time in order to become fully human and show us the way. Verse 10 in Hebrews chapter 2, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. How did Jesus become the captain of our salvation? By becoming just like us. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one, the same, he says. We can't be the same with Jesus if he's fully God and fully man simultaneously because we never will be and can't be. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here I am in the children whom God has given to me. Listen carefully at the next words God speaks. Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. Irrefutable that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Jesus had to come as a man in order to have his death pay the sin penalty that we needed to pay. Verse 15, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word of God, according to Jesus, if we abide in his words, we are his disciples indeed, and we will know the truth, and the truth will set us free. Listen to the truth of the word of God. Not anybody else who's ever told you any other story and that you didn't check out from the word of God. John chapter 8 is where I quoted that passage of abiding in the word of God. Verse 16 the Lord says, for indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. This clears up both whether or not angels can be brought to repentance or not, but it also indicates that the nature that Jesus had to take on was not angelic. It's fully human in order to give aid to us. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Listen to these next words. Verse 17, therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. Let's not argue about this subject anymore. Let's not be confused. Jesus was fully human when he, by the power of the Holy Spirit, came forth from the womb of Mary. He was fully human at that point and had to experience every phase of life that we experience and every challenge that we experience and every temptation that we experience, every pain and suffering point that we experience, and more so, because then our sin was placed on him, sin that he did not do. And he took it upon himself and paid our penalty. After having shown us that we can live lives successfully dedicated to our Father in heaven, walking in the Spirit. And he, listening to the rest of this passage, Verse 17 again, therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, not the angels. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. As we are tempted and tested, the reason Listening to, learning from, and following Jesus can be helpful to us is because in every way, he faced the same things. He was not excluded from any of them because he was the God-man. That's not true. What is true is he became flesh and dwelt among us. He became fully human for a little while, lower than the angels, and he subjected himself to everything that we are subject to. 
And God doesn't cease to being God ruling over his creation because with three persons in one God, the Father and the Holy Spirit are still doing what they do to rule and reign over creation, keeping all order still in place. And furthermore, showing us that Jesus coming in the flesh can dedicate his life to being pleasing to his Father and walking in the Spirit can be successful. The very thing God calls us to do. The very thing God calls us to do. And we have no excuse to say, but I'm not Jesus. That has nothing to do with it. You're absolutely right. You're not Jesus and I'm not Jesus. And before Jesus came in the flesh, he was the eternal, immutable, magnificent, glorious, majestic God with all power and all capacity. And then for a while, he set it aside to become a little lower than the angels. And he became flesh and dwelt among us to become like us, to show us the way, and to provide for, for us the sacrifice that would be effective for us, the substitute sacrifice of paying the penalty for our sin. How did he do that? Our sin was placed on him. He took our sin and paid the penalty for us. And we receive his cleansed record, and we need to go forth now honoring that cleansed record. And now that he's risen from the dead, he has retaken on the fullness of his glory and majesty, no longer limited by being just in the flesh. And he is our great and wonderful God and high priest. This is a subject that is sensitive to some people, highly sensitive to some people. Some of what I just said is very, very offensive to some people. They would call it blasphemous. No different than things Jesus said were called blasphemous by the people who resisted him coming and him taking the place in their hearts and minds that he was supposed to take. When people have something to protect of their own that gives them privilege, it is not uncommon for them to try to protect it in such a way that they will say and do anything to protect it for temporary rewards, if you will. If somebody wants a copy of the explanation of the humanity of Jesus, just contact us at XL for Christ and I'll send it out to you. Email us. Go to xlforchrist.org and send us an email and we'll send it to you. But the Word of God speaks of this significantly. This is not my narrative and all the things that I have developed on why I think logically or rationally. This is simply what God says about who Jesus is, but also who he was while he was in the flesh living among us. And we can choose to accept that and say, you know what? He is a good example for me to watch and listen to and follow without excuse as to why I'm not going to achieve what he wants me to achieve by blaming it on him because he had some capacities that I just don't have and it's not fair. You see, that's a tactic of the enemy to get us to give up and not strive to be transformed into the image of our Lord and Savior Jesus. This subject is enormously important for us to understand and for us to not negate in some way. Here's some other pieces for you to take <coughs> note of. When God says Jesus became flesh, the word in Greek has to do with a transformation from one condition to another, not a brand new coming into being as if he never existed before. And clearly, when God says this in John chapter 1, verse 14, he'd already set the precedence that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all that's been created was created through him. Well, we don't have to wonder about whether or not he's just coming into existence and when he comes in the flesh. He changed from one thing to another. According to God in Romans chapter 8 and Romans chapter 9, and it's 
reinforced actually in Genesis chapter 5, that Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Those are powerful words. According to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, in order for us to be partakers of the gift Jesus gives of dying on the cross and paying the penalty of our sin, he had to become like us, fully like us. It also tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. In 1 Peter chapter 3, 18, his existence from birth to death was in the flesh. Jesus' power came from the Holy Spirit while he was in the flesh, according to God in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, and many other places. If you read Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 32, you'll find that in this case, Jesus himself admits that he's doing the works that he's doing by the power of the Holy Spirit out of his own mouth. When you look at the Word of God, Jesus was led by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, directed by the Spirit, built up by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. According to Hebrews chapter 9, Jesus offered himself through the Spirit, not just on his own. God declares Jesus' power comes from the Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 4. Jesus taught his disciples in the power of the Holy Spirit, according to the Holy Spirit, in Acts chapter 1, verse 2. In 2 Corinthians 5, 16, we hear the Holy Spirit declare that Jesus was flesh for a time and is now again divine, fully filled or fully holding now his characteristics as God that he had set aside temporarily. And Philippians 2, 5, 8 that I read it explains that although Jesus had existed since eternity past, he chose to temporarily change. He chose to empty himself and become just like us. That passage makes absolutely no sense when you, when you put it together with he was still fully God. Then what did he empty himself of? then how would he have made himself of no reputation at all if he's still fully God? That makes absolutely no sense, but that's exactly how we know that it's the devil that's behind that story that he was still fully God while in the flesh. Hebrews chapter 5 tells us, verse 7 tells us, there was an appointed time and purpose for Jesus being limited in the flesh. As I said earlier in John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, Jesus, out of his own mouth, prays a particular prayer where he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may also glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus' own mouth is very clear that in his present human condition, he is currently lacking that glory that he once had equal with the Father. And he is committing himself to doing the will of the Father knowing that he can absolutely count on his father to do what his father has committed to do to reestablish Jesus in the fullness of his glory by raising him from the dead and giving him the position that he set aside to become fully human without God being corrupted in any way because the father and the Holy Spirit continue on in full charge, full power, full wisdom, Full capacity. Jesus, the word who was and is and always shall forevermore be God, made himself for a little while 
to be as human as you and I. Setting aside his divine privilege to become like us in all ways. To teach us his way of life. That we should live. And to pay the penalty for sin of those he vicariously assimilated to. In other words, he became like. And became the gift of life for those he became like who will choose him as their Lord and Savior. Believe his words and surrender to him, recognizing that the only rescue and redemption was by the work that he had done, not by any works that we can do. But he has been restored to glory, the glory he had with the Father before the foundations of time, space, and matter, as fully God, to rule his creation by his word, not the superstitions of other people that want to make up stories about him. The covenant relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit made this possible for God to persist in complete sovereign rule, while one of the three persons of God, all co-equal with one another, had made himself temporarily but exclusively like us. Jesus lived as we are to live, dependent upon the Holy Spirit. To lead us to and in the life God has designed for all humans to live. For his glory. And he did it without any extra privilege over those he has led. He did it being coming just like us and showing us the way. And he did it fully pleasing to our Father in heaven. If he is our Father, this should be our same level of dedication. That doesn't mean we're going to do exactly the same things Jesus did. It means we're going to be dedicated to being pleasing to our Father in heaven. We're going to be dedicated to listening to and walking in the Spirit. We're going to be dedicated to learning from the Word of the Lord how now we shall live if He is our Father. This is how we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is from which we can learn to love others as Jesus has loved us. This is the grace of God bestowed upon us. By the grace of God, Jesus was made this way so that he could do for us what he's done. And by the grace of God, we can learn this lesson rightly and follow him correctly. And if he had not done this, his sacrifice would have not done anything for us because he wouldn't be like us. And for the same reason God says the blood of goats and rams cannot rescue us from our sin, neither can Jesus if he's not fully human. Now there are some who say, oh, it's just a mystery how Jesus can be fully human and fully God. No, it's not. It's baloney. It's not a mystery. It's a fabrication. Jesus, according to his own word, emptied himself, set aside these divine characteristics, and made himself a little lower than the angels for a little while to become in every way like his brethren, so that he could be the minister for his brethren that we needed him to be. This is God telling us these things. Now we can choose to believe him or we can dig our heels in and demand that we're still going to believe the storytellers that told us those stories. And the only reason we would do that is to protect our failed attempts at not doing well of being pleasing in the sight of the Lord. The only reason we would defend, oh, I can't do as well as Jesus because he is so much better than me in the flesh is because we don't want to strive to be pleasing to God. We don't want to walk in the spirit. We still want to sow to the lust of our flesh. That's why we would defend it. Because it's not defensible by the word of God. That's the important thing to remember. The word of God indicates Jesus did come in the flesh. Holy and completely as you and I. 
And according to what we read in 1 John chapter 4, it's the spirit of Antichrist that teaches anything else. This we must be careful about. This we must be on guard against. Thank you for joining us today on our YouTube channel, XL for Christ. We hope you like and even subscribe to our YouTube channel for ongoing edification that you can gain from listening to the messages and hopefully diving further into the Word of God to find out His truth. We also like you to visit our website at xlforchrist.org. This website talks about the discipleship process that we engage in with folks to help them grow in Christ. We hope you will join us in our endeavor to make disciples for the glory of God.